This podcast is brought to you by the Islamic Center and NYU. For more information, visit our website at www.icnyu.org. Bismillah, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. We thought tonight we would do a halakha uh, going over the significance of the Isra and Miraj. And to be able to draw some lessons and meanings from it, extrapolate some understandings, relevancy to our day to day. We want to be able to, at this juncture, start to extrapolate deeper meaning from the narratives that we're given. It's the most majestic journey that is defined within the Quran, expounded upon within the prophetic tradition. And for many of us, we engage it on a daily basis, right? So within the Sunni tradition, and I ask Sheikh Faz as well, if this is within the Shi'i tradition, when we sit down in our prayer, we're referencing the Isra and Miraj every time we're in our prayer, right? When you say the Atayatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibatu, assalamu alayka ayyu an nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatu to the end of that statement, This is a conversation that in our tradition we're taught is between the Prophet and Allah when the Prophet goes to the highest of levels of Jannah after he speaks with Musa and I'm sure we'll hear more from Sheikh Faz and Sheikh uh, Suhaib on this. But why I want to use that as a framing for our conversation as we're getting situated into it. There's nothing without meaning in Allah's plan, right? He is Al-Hakim. So if we're revisiting these words on a daily basis in our prayer, multiple times a day, referencing something that is rooted now in this occurrence, there's likely a lot that we can take from it and allow for ourselves to continue to revisit it, to engage it daily, so that the gain is for us and the increase is for us. Do you get what I'm saying? And so what I'm encouraging you all to do tonight is to not just sit here in a way where it kind of is absorbed rotely or is engaged in a similar capacity to how it might have been taught to you. You've likely heard the hadith that we're going to share with you or heard the verses that you're going to hear, but to utilize the opportunity to start to think about it deeply. How do I take from this and implement it? How do I utilize it to actualize some of these lessons and teachings, right? Why would the divine give me something in the course of the most fundamental ritual that I have, a reminder that comes back to this occurrence within the Prophet Salam's life? And there's so much that you can unpack that in an hour, We're not going to do so much other than touch the surface. And I'll say it in the beginning and at the end when we wrap up as well, but it's going to be important that when you go from here, you go back and you engage the text also, right? You revisit the verses of the Quran. You read the various narrations in the Hadith that speak about this, and you just start to think about it, reflect upon it. Why do these things happen, right? Why is this found referenced in our prayer? Why do we have the Prophet going on this majestic journey into Jannah and in the midst of it, Allah first has him go to Jerusalem? Why? Why doesn't he just go straight to paradise? Why, when he's given the opportunity to choose between wine and milk, does he choose the milk? Why is there references to individuals who stood up to the tyranny of Fir'aun within some of the narrations of this? You hear about very specific details of a woman who used to comb the hair of Fir'aun's daughter. Why? Why are these things given to us? And what does it mean to me and my individual practice and relationship with the divine? There's so much that we're going to try to get into tonight, but I want you to be present, not just physically, but in an inward sense as well, so that you're really kind of contemplating and reflecting upon it. And then when we engage in conversation, Q&A, 
to allow for yourself to be comfortable to also share your own insights and ideas so that we can benefit and hear from each other. Does that make sense? So I'm going to ask Sheikh Sahib to start us off, inshallah, uh, after which Sheikh Fayaz, and we'll open up to some discussion, Q&A. Uh, if people have any questions in between as well, be okay if they were to bring it up and, and ask, I'm assuming. Um, but Sheikh Fadl, we can start whenever you're ready. A'udhu Billahi Samia Al-Alim, Amin Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Sayyid al-Awaleen wal-Akhirin, al-Fatihi lima ghulq, sabiq ima, al-Khatihi lima sabiq, Allahumma salli wa barak wa salam alayhi fi al-Awaleen wa fi al-Akhirin wa fi al-Malik la'ala ya Rabbil Alameen. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, send peace and blessings upon uh, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon the Ashraf, Tariya, the family of the Prophet sallam, and the companions of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, of course we all know in the 17th chapter, the opening of that chapter, he says, After all the bilayim in shaitan rajim, Subhana alladhi asra bi abadihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly mentions the isra, this travel at night. The word asiru means I'm traveling at night actually. Isra actually means to travel at night. Of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam. There is actually something really important that comes out of the language. Isra is what's called Masta. Isra. Although if you think about it, if you speak Arabic, we don't say Isra wal Uruj. That actually would be the way to say it. Like outside of religious nomenclature, Isra and Uruj from Araj. But as Isra and Mi'raj, the word Mi'raj is called Ismu Ala. It's a noun which is used to show a tool. Like Miqas is a comb. So we learn something very important from this way of describing this night that Mi'raj is a tool given to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Isra is a tool given to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a very important situation in his life in the lives of his fledgling community who at that time were under 70 people. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's another important lesson that we take. So the lesson we take is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just as he has provided the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with tools uh, to deal with difficult situations, we as followers of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have been also given tools to use that we should put into play. There's also a second lesson that we take from this night that the word uruj, and I'm not trying to make it complicated for people, means to su'ud wa nuzul, to go up and then go down again. But usually in Arabic, we, we use the word mif'al when we're talking about something like the, the elevator is called mas'ad. Because it implies that you never come down. Mi'raj means just to keep going. And nobody should think that the Prophet wasallam he didn't return. Of course, on that night after being taken above the seven heavens. But his maqam and his status never descends. فَهُوَ دَائِمًا فِي mi'raj. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's always his, mar- his martaba, his, his status. La It has no ending. That's why Allah says, He didn't say, wa in, wa fika He didn't say, like, you have character. He said, you are above. Like, if you were to look at character, the citadel of good character would be the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever we know, Shaykh Azizuddin Abdul Salam says, of any good character, from now to the end of time, the Prophet Sallallahu has ascended above that good character. So there's also a great lesson that in one of the lowest moments of the life of the da'wah, and today Sheikh will talk about is the day the da'wah started, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam is reminded that your status with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will never descend. 
And the same thing applies to us. That's why in the Quran, the, the, the pixels of the Arabic language are profound. Ala huda mir rabbihim. When Allah talks about the ummah of the Prophet, he says, ala, like they are above guidance, is literally the meaning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised you because you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Yarfa ilahu ladina amanu minkum, wa ladina utul ilm darajat. Allah has raised the believers. So, right after the year of sadness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the loss of Khadija al Kubra alayhi salam, Sayyidah Khadija, who's called al Kubra, because out of all of the wives of the Prophet, وسلم, she has the special place. And the loss of his blessed uncle, who was there to support him and serve him, although we know there's some differences between Muslims on did he die as a Muslim or not Muslim, for the Sunnis who majority hold he died as a non-Muslim, you find something profound that the Prophet وسلم, as mentioned by Fakhruddin Arazi, he made istighfar for his uncle till the verses in Surah Tawbah were sent in the last year of Medina. So you're talking three years before the migration until the last verses of Surah Tawbah are sent to him. The Prophet would make istighfar for his family. That was the loss that he felt from his, his uncle, his, his fidelity, his love. So now we can appreciate what it meant to lose in that year of sadness. And there's another opinion among some Sunni jurists that is called the year of sadness because the da'wah stopped. And when the da'wah stopped, this is a sad time. You know, there's nothing happening. Regardless, and then he goes to Ta'if and he's rejected. Subhanallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. As one of our teachers said, لَوْ كُنْتَ شَهِدْتَ What happened to him, you will see أَعْظَمَ hilm. You'll see the greatest forgiveness ever given to anybody was when the Prophet ﷺ was asked to destroy those people. He said, أَرْجُوا أَنْ يُخْرِجَ اللَّهُ مِنْ أَصْلَابِهِمْ مَنْ يَعْبُدُهُ وَلَا يُفِقُوا بِشَيْئًا Don't destroy them. How we differ with the left and the right on cancel culture is that we believe in redemption. And because we're not secular, we don't believe in killing and destroying people now in hell, in dunya. Because we believe in hell and the akhiraz with Allah. For most situations, there's the door of toba, The door of evolving. Religion believes that people can evolve and change and be better. They may lose their responsibilities. That's different. But they have a chance to turn to Allah. So the Prophet said, you know, I hope that don't destroy them. Ta'if. I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will extract from their offspring those who worship Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At that moment, as one of our teachers said, the Prophet, everyone on the face of the earth rejected him. But in the heavens, he became a king. And that's the meaning of Isra here, this tool. That if everyone turns away from you because you're holding on to your principles, if people turn away from you because their injustice is like infected their souls, so they can't see beyond very simple things like race, ethnicity, gender, language, social status, economic status. That's them. Bulsayri says something nice. If your eyes infected, don't blame the painter. Their, uh, their hearts are sick. So Allah said to the Prophet, وسلم, if everyone in the earth has rejected you, the heavens have accepted you. So we see that Mi'raj and Isra are actually like a, a great opportunity for Allah SWT to support his Prophet. And that's why in, in Sunni theology, we don't consider Isra and Mi'raj from the miracles of the Prophet. Mu'jizat are largely defined as those things used to, repute, to reply to the disbelievers. So like using the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about like a miracle of the Prophet sort of like in Shiqaq wa Qamar, like the splitting of the moon. Like usually when they see those signs of the Prophet that are considered miracles, you find their responses recorded that they, they deny it, they reject it, they turn away from him. But Isra and Mi'raj, that's why Abu Sayyidi in the Burda, he doesn't mention it under the list of miracles. And that's why in the books of Sunnah, 
amongst us, Bukhari and Muslim, they don't mention Isra and Mi'raj under the miracles of the Prophet. They have their own chapters. Actually, the rest of the four books of the Sunnah, as well as the Masanid, they all put it under what's called its own section. Why? Because it's called from the Khasa'is. What are the Khasa'is? Those special things given to the Prophet what we call Tanwi'a uh, Sharaf, to like show his incredible honor, his status, and to support him. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So as we reflect sort of on the meaning of Isra and Mi'raj, it's coming after, if the Prophet had followers on Instagram, like when he went to Ta'if, they would have lost, he would have lost their foot. There would only been like 60 people. If he had a Twitter account or TikTok account or Twitch account or whatever, you would have saw like his followers disappeared. He would have been hurt. He was banished. He lost his wife. He lost his uncle. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him Islam Mi'raj. And it's very clear. Linuriyahu min ayatina. Linuriyahu for him to strengthen him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So alhamdulillah, like there are so many, you know, lessons that can be taken from this incredible event that happened. But one that I think has to be centered, especially amongst us as Muslims, is that in this era, caring for a Muslim is an act of post-colonial revolt. And to love each other is an affront to Eurocentricism and white supremacy. But outside of all that, it's a sign that I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To love the ummah is to love Allah. To care for the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to be a standard bearer of the flag of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who on this night at the most important moment in his career didn't forget his ummah. That's why again there's something here you lose in English. When Sayyidina Jibreel says to him you know, تَقَدَّمْ يَا Muhammad at Sidrat al-Muntaha, like, you go, you go. In the process of he goes, and then he meets Allah Azza wa Jal, and he says, أَتَّحِيَاتُ لِلَّهِ وَالصَّلَوَاتُ وَالطَّيِّبَاتُ Which was taught to him by Khadija, by the way. When Jibreel came to the Prophet and said, Allah is sending salam to you and sending salam to Khadija. Say to Khadija, she said, أَتَّحِيَاتُ لِلَّهِ وَالصَّلَوَاتُ وَالطَّيِّبَاتُ Like what we say in our prayer came from our mother. So the Prophet said that. And then, Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyyu wa rahmatuhu wa barakatuh. The answer comes. At that moment, from one of my teachers I heard, the conversation could have stopped. But the Prophet says something, he interjects something. And if you think about it in Arabic, there's no wow. There's no wa salamu alayna. Very similar to the angels when Allah says, I'm creating fil ardi khalifa. Qalu atajal. Isn't that wa qalu? There's no wow. That's why I wrote one poem. I said, مَا كَانَ بَيْنَ مُحَبَّتِي مُحَمَّدٍ لِأُمَّتِي حَرْفُ وَاوِي أَبَدَ There was no, there's nothing between the Prophet's love for his ummah and himself, not even wow, the letter wow. We should all say wow. <laughs> so at that moment, he, he blurts it. As-salamu alayna. Like, don't forget them. Don't forget my ummah. And for those people who struggle to be adherent Muslims, those people who struggle to be committed Muslims, he made a special dua. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in an age of irreligiosity, where heathenry is now the minbar of society, where celebrities are the imams, where the wretched of the earth are forgotten, we can talk about that text, and where Morality has been turned upside down. We find like a lot of strength in the Isra and Mi'raj of Sayyidina Muhammad. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported him. He gave him this important tool. And that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returned this care back to his blessed community. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakam Allahu khairan. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahman rahim وَبِهِ نَسْتَعِينُ وَالصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا وَنَبِيَنَا وَحَبِيبَ قُلُوبِنَا وَالشَّفِيَا نُقُوسِنَا أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد 
وآل محمد. You know, in life, I think there's a lot of things to be grateful for, and God mentions numerous times in the Quran about our responsibility with regards to showing gratitude and gratefulness and thankfulness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That famous anecdote that said that God was speaking to Moses, Musa, known as Kalim Allah, the one who would speak to God. And he says, O oh Musa, show gratitude and thankfulness to me the way you ought to. And as Musa السلام, was reflecting upon how he should show the sense of gratitude to God, after a little while, he turned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said, Oh Allah, true thankfulness is knowing that no matter how much I ought to show gratitude to you, whatever I say, or even my expression of thankfulness requires thankfulness in and of itself. Think about what he says for just a moment. Me having the ability to say, oh Allah, thank you, requires another gratitude, requires another show of thanks because I'm able to speak. Me having the intellectual, rational ability to remind myself to be thankful requires another show of gratitude. So he said that every show of gratitude requires another show of gratitude, meaning that all thankfulness is due to you, uh, oh Allah. But nonetheless, in light of all of the bounties and blessings that we are surrounded by on a day-to-day basis, and we should, we should undoubtedly verbalize those. Of course, we can say, oh Allah, thanks be to you for all things, for instance. Thanks be to you for all of the blessings that you have descended upon me. To actually recollect those which are apparent to you are also important. How many of us have been thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a famous dua of Ali ibn al-Hussein Zain al-Abideen, great-grandson of the Messenger of God. He says, Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'alani ashtahi. All, all thanks is due to you who has given me the ability to crave, to crave food during the month of Ramadan. That itself is, is nice. Imagine all food tasted the same, for instance. Pretty lame, right? Life. So to actually recollect the blessings that we are surrounded and that we are drowned by on a day-to-day basis is important. And I say all of this because I think that the most unique and the greatest blessing that we have in this room and that which undoubtedly needs to be a show of gratitude between us and our creator is being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being exposed to the light of the messenger of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa To literally thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the ability to be exposed to the greatest of God's creations. Innaka la ala khuluqin adheem, as the shaykh just mentioned, wa ma'arsalnaka la rahmatin lil alameen. What would life be like if our hearts hadn't been exposed to the Prophet ﷺ? A couple of points that I want to share with you this evening, inshallah, then I'll pass it to Mawqal. Firstly, when the Messenger of God ﷺ, he makes this ascension toward the highest level where even the angel Jibra'il could no longer cross so that he could be solely in the company of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he returns back to his community, they rush toward him and they say, oh, messenger of God, how about us? And there were just a handful of them. Sheikh mentioned 70, 70 companions. We have a hadith within uh, Shi'i text that say it was less than 40 people during that time, meaning it was certainly before the Hijrah naturally, but very in the early stages. And the dates, according to Shi'i theologians and historians, differs. Not exactly certain whether this event took place on the 27th of Rajab or which year, uh, how many years before the Hijrah, some say 10, some say more or less. Anyhow, that those group of early Muslims, they come to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and even later, after the Prophet makes the migration, and they ask him, How do we make that ascension as well? 
So he says that every one of you also have that potential, maybe not in the same way as the messenger of God, but through your worship and through your obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have the opportunity to be in a state of connectivity. Salat ma'raj al-mu'min, like a hadith from the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, states that prayers in itself is that ascension of the believer. So to making sure that we are dedicated to the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa by acting in the way that he acted, particularly when it comes to his relationship with God. For so many people today, I think it's a fair assessment to suggest that Muslims in this part of the world or in this day and age are so drowned so many a times by the obstacles and challenges that we face you know, socio-politically. So young Muslims these days are very openly Muslim about their you know, religious identity, so to say. That's wonderful and that's great. And oftentimes it's due to a response of Islamophobia and all of the other challenges that we face, again, socio-politically. Well, once in a while, it's important to build our relationship with this religion based on our understanding or seeking toward increasing our understanding of who our creator is. We can talk about being Muslim loudly as often as we want, but not to the neglect of a conversation about our personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You follow what I'm saying? A lot of times we remove God, so to say, from the equation of our lives and of our understanding of this religion. And everything that we learn about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam through the midst of this journey is that the only thing that he sees is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only thing that he sees after this journey is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in spite of all of those obstacles that he was facing prior to making that ascension and all of the challenges that he had to endure thereafter during the course of his life, again, he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the midst of every one of those moments. So this is an important point that I wanted to share with you all. The second thing is that on this night, the 27th night of Rajab, in Shi'i tradition, it's known as the beginning of the prophetic journey or the prophetic message of our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. It's what is known as Laylatul Mab'ath. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, like we know, he begins to preach the religion at the age of 40. And he preaches it after receiving divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to begin the dissemination of this religion. And so this night is meant to be a night of reflection and of worship and of obedience, but more important than any of that, a night of thankfulness and gratitude like I began with. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, that he has exposed us to the light of this man, the greatest of God's creation. So I wanted to share with you all a salutation, a sarawat recited upon the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, that talks a little bit about the greatness and the uniqueness of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In this supplication known as Dua al-Sabah, Dua al-Sabah, which is the morning supplication, he says, Sallallahumma ala dalili ilayka fil al-aliyal. He states, Oh Allah, send blessings upon the guide, the guide to you in the darkest of nights. Of course, he is speaking to some of the characteristics of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So, oh Allah, bless the guide to you in the darkest of nights. When we talk about guidance, there's two different sort of forms or manifestations of someone who offers guidance. I'll give you an example. You're walking in the streets between the train station and the Islamic center, and someone comes up to you and says, where is the closest e-train? Either you could tell them, walk down a couple of blocks and you'll find at the corner of West 3rd and whatever, uh, 6th Avenue, uh, the closest e-train. Or you could literally take their hand or you could say, walk with me. Let me show you where the closest train station is. Is that fair to say? Is there a third? Probably that mo more likely than not, we would tell them, just go walk down a couple of blocks and you'll see it. Very unlikely 
would we say, why don't you walk with me and I'll show you exactly where it is. Even in a building like this, with your own friends or your own peers, someone asks you, where's the restroom? You'll tell them, yeah, just go turn around the corner, you'll, you'll, you'll find it. Very rarely are you going to find someone who says, let me walk with you and I'll show you exactly where the restroom is and open the door for them and say, here you go. Right? Is that fair to say? The difference between the guidance of others and the guidance of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wasallam, is that he's not going to point you in the direction. He's going to hold your hand and walk you in that direction. So when we say that one of the names of the Messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa is al-Hadi, that literally he is the guide and is the guide when things are really dark. And someone could interpret it as the climate that the Prophet ﷺ was in during those early days. But in reality, in life, when we're looking for direction in anything, you can go back to the life of the Prophet ﷺ and find some light in the midst of your darkness. So he begins this salutation upon the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam, and he states, sallallahumma ala dalili ilayka fil layl al Oh Allah, and send blessings upon that guide who takes, who takes everyone to you in those darkest of nights. He continues and he says, walmasiki min asbabika bihabl al-sharaf al-atwal. And bless him who in the midst of all of the different ropes that there are to find salvation, bless him who has the strongest rope and is the longest rope. In other words, that when there's confusion with regards to matters of belief, with matters of theology, when there's a lack of clarity with regards to so many things during the course of our lives, again, that longest rope of salvation is that of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. When you're confused, when you don't know where to turn, when you don't know how to act in a particular circumstance, when you're challenged by family, relationships, life, again, you can revert back and find something in the life and in the legacy or in the words, the hadith of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, that again, give us some hope and give us some inspiration to push forward during the course of our lives. Really, it's so important, I think, that on nights like these, that we really go back to building out this meaningful relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam by learning about his life, by reading about his life, by again, by reading the words that he narrated these ahadith of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Not all of them are about you know, matters of fiqh and about law and jurisprudence like many of us, we think. But in reality, so many of his words, so many of his advices, again, are this light that illuminates these hearts of ours that sometimes so desperately need it. We need something to inspire us, to wake us up uh, once in a while. That reminds me, actually, that in one of the ziyarat, uh, one of the one of the salutations that we are recommended, at least in Shi'i tradition, to recite when we go to visit the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When we're standing in front of the grave of the Messenger of God, we say that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he is Ahmadi min al awsaf that he his 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 attributes, um, he's he's too praiseworthy to attribute any characteristic to him, meaning that no matter how eloquent uh, someone is in describing the merits of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi no matter how beautiful the poetry is that honors the Messenger of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's only the movement of tongue because that in itself is not befitting for the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam. So he says, Sallallahumma ala dalili ilayka fil layl al aliyal wal masaki min asbabika bahabl al sharaf al atwal wal nas al hasabi fi dirwat al kahil al a'bal. He talks and he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to praise the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa ala, whose glory is evident 
at the highest of mountains. And there's an interpretation for it, but I think I'll take too much of time. And he concludes the salutation. He says, وَثَابِتَ الْقَدَمِ عَلَى زَهَالِيفِهَا فِي الزَّمَنِ الْأَوَّلِ And he states, and oh Allah, bless him. Meaning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sends salutations upon him. Who is that firm stance? Is that firm standing on that slippery slope? You're standing at the top of a hill and it had just snowed the day before and that entire hill had frozen over. When you're standing at the top of the hill, it's a really good chance that you're going to slip, that you're going to fall to the bottom and you're going to get injured. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that which allows for you to stand firm in the midst of rocky waters. So praise be to him. Ali is saying, praise be to him who allows for us as well to stand firm in the midst of the very slippery slope. Again, going back, that through our exposure to the light of the Prophet ﷺ, through the religion that the Prophet ﷺ taught us by holding our hand, through that, we have the opportunity, again, to always find a sense of clarity and understanding and meaning in this world. I'll conclude with this verse of the whole Quran, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the second to last verse of chapter 9, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا أَنِدْتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَوْفُ الرَّحِيمِ God says that surely a messenger has come from amongst you. عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا أَنِدْتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَوْفُ الرَّحِيمِ And that when we are in a state of grief, the Prophet والسلام, he himself is also in a state of distress. <laughs> and that to the believers, God says that he is a Ra'uf, a Rahim, the same attributes that he attributes to himself. Of course, when we talk about the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way that it's paralleled with the Messenger of God, there's no comparison. But nonetheless, the language is similar in order to demonstrate just how merciful, just how caring, just how loving, just how concerned that the Prophet والسلام, is and has about every single one of us in this room, in this gathering. So whether we believe that this is the night of the Ma'raj of the Messenger of God or the night of the beginning of the prophetic message of the Messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a couple of important takeaways as reminders to myself. Number one, let's be in a state of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we know this messenger, alayhi salatu wa Literally, maybe you pray a turaka prayer. Maybe you go into the state of prostration. Maybe you just say, ashkuruka ya Allah, shukran lillah, alhamdulillah, that you have guided us to the light of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam. A second thing is to making sure that we are walking in the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu in terms of our relationship with Allah The Prophet Sallam makes this ascension and he begins to proclaim this message so that we are drawn closer toward God. At the end of the day, think about how I can improve and talk to myself, how I can improve my relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala beginning on this night. And thirdly and finally, remember, that the messenger of God, alayhi salatu wasalam, he's concerned about you and he cares about you and he loves you. And my response to that is to making sure that I am building a meaningful relationship with this prophet of mine by learning about his life, by reading about his legacy and by benefiting from his words. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfir. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. You want to get into the habit of being able to express in spaces where no one's going to jump to tell you what you're saying is right only or wrong profusely, but so you can start to build a relationship with the information and knowledge that you acquire and recognize what you think about it, right? It'll become more reinforced, not when it's just kind of front facing and you just absorb it like a sponge, but then don't do anything with it. You want to get to a place where you're thinking about it now and engaging it in meaningful ways. Do you, you get what I mean? A couple of things that I wanted to share, and then maybe we can come back to it. And I'll be really quick. Um, you know, at the culmination of this journey, 
the Prophet ﷺ now has to come back and tell people what he went through. He has to be able to extend insight to his experience to people who are not able to experience what he experienced. And I think there's a couple of things that are very profound from this that we can reflect upon. One, how good must the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam be that people take his word when he says that he has gone from his home to the city of Jerusalem and ascends into the heavens, right? I mean, just think about that now as the starting point of the dissemination of this message. And when you think, you know, in the kind of route of the journey he takes, he goes to Jerusalem, he prays with all of the prophets were taught, giving an indication that he is connected to a chain of individuals that are sent as a means of guidance to this world, but he's the last one. And when you're placing a seal on something, the idea is that you're not doing so, so that whatever it is that you're seeking to preserve now somehow becomes lost, but it's to in fact just preserve it. And his character, as was mentioned by Sheikh Faz and Sheikh Sahib, is so defined that he's able to tell people that he went on this journey on this creature that they've never seen the likes of go an entire distance to Jerusalem, which would take them a long period of time. He did it in a night, ascends to the heavens and comes all the way back and has to tell people about it. And they believe him. And a hallmark characteristic of this tradition is to be somebody who's trustworthy. To have and live with such integrity and dignity that, yeah, there was people who doubted him. There was people who couldn't understand why he was saying what he was saying. But there are still people. And to this day, you've seen trillions of people traverse the earth over 14 centuries And they take what he has said that he did. And in large part, some of that comes from them just knowing who he is as an honest, good person. I want you to think about that because you can see now a deep times attachment to things outward and external when it comes to religion and the practice of religion that a generalization we can make is people become too focused on the form and not the inward aspect of it. And it's not to get down, but to have aspiration. You want to be good the way that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was good. And you can see where there's tons of Muslims who are in leadership positions. They're authoritative. The examples that they have are not of vessels that are containing things that are real sincere, but there's always a hesitation to be able to say, do I really trust this person? I can doubt them, what it is that they're talking about. And I think the second part that stems from that is that they believe him because of who he is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but they're also believing him because of who they are and what they possess. And I would want you all to reflect on a tangible example of what faith actually means. Because there's so much in our discourse that talks to us about Iman and being from the Mu'minin. May Allah make us from amongst them. But the certitude that they have in this man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the real yaqeen that becomes now an entry point to the certitude that they have in divine promise is rooted in a faith that is very concrete. Everybody has reasonable faith, right? You wake up in the morning and you're going to expect that the water is going to work in your dorm and the lights are going to work in your kitchen. You're going to come here like all of you will assume. Whether you appreciate or not is subjective, 
but you will assume that there is a room for you to pray in, right? Individuals, whether they have faith in the sense of religious belief or not, they exercise reasonable faith throughout the course of their daily routines. A train will eventually come. A bus is going to be there. These people believed in the Prophet وسلم, and Allah the way that you and I believe that the lights will turn on when we hit the switch. A faith that is so rooted in something concrete that he can tell them that I went and did this thing and they believe him. The first step in the acquisition of a faith like that, that I would say you want to aspire towards and make dua for, because it'll render real contentment. The first step in the acquisition of something like that is that you got to want it for yourself. You got to want to have something that's not just rotely regurgitated, abstract theological doctrine that I can spit out because I memorized from a book that was likely written to disprove somebody else's nuanced opinions on theology. But you start to just deeply engage in it and then reflect that people can actually believe in this way. So that everything that's being told here is rooted in a belief in divine promises. There will be ease after difficulty. You sustain it. You go through it. It's hard. You don't have to pretend like you're not human. But faith is what gets you through things. Not blindly, not mindlessly, but it can be fully rational you got to work towards that and have to want it, though. Do you get what I'm saying? And it's so remarkable that he can come down, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and who he is helps them to understand and embrace it. But what they're cultivating now also becomes a means and mechanism through which they can take it in and realize and recognize it as something that is actual, without hesitation. Do you get what I'm saying? There's other things that we can extrapolate from this tradition and what's rooted in the instance of the Isra and Mi'raj. Go home and like read about it and just look at it and then talk to each other and turn to one another. Like, what does this mean? What do we take from it? How do we actualize upon it? So that it's not just a story, right? It's not just something that we use to kind of hear, but not really take from, and then start to think about it more deeply. I think it shouldn't be lost on any of us that our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on this journey to the heavens has a stop in Jerusalem. Right? May Allah end the occupation that's taking place in Palestine. And you want to think deeply about it. We went right before the pandemic on a trip to Jerusalem. It's a beautiful place, man. Have you ever been to Medina? Who's been to Medina before? You raise your hands. You've been in Medina. You've likely felt like the gentle breezes that are in Medina. When you sit outside the Prophet Islam's masjid, there's a serenity, a peace that's like unlike any place. Have you ever seen like the sky after Fajr time and you're feeling like these gentle winds? The only other place I have felt that in the world is in Jerusalem, in the Haram there. And when you're at the Dome of the Rock, that essentially is now exemplifying, it's indicative of the step point of the Prophet Alayhi ascension into the heavens, you're at Masjid al-Aqsa, the winds, they feel the same. They're just as gentle. You want to learn about our history and what takes place there and what's taking place there now. And you can see so much that goes into this journey and the Prophet Alayhi is taking in insight and advices from different prophets that he's meeting. There's a lot that goes in in terms of accountability and decision-making, right? 
He chooses the milk over the wine when it's given to him, the option. He knows how to make choice. This is the fundamental basis of sound spirituality. It's rooted in your decision-making. For many of us, though, we get to the place of what? You can't get to the Aqaba. Because when you get to the Najdain, you don't know how to make a decision. And we want to get to a place where we start to feel comfortable and find empowerment through our religion and through these teachings and through these stories, right? And this is a really, really, really amazing, majestic journey that's vividly described to us. Engage it. Try to draw meaning from it. You get what I'm saying? Are there any things that you both would recommend if people wanted to read more about the subject matter that they could access, like when they leave from here? And that's yeah. like specific parts of the Quran. Like Omar Suleiman has a really good lecture. I think you can find like a lecture by Omar Suleiman uh, online that goes through Islam. It's really good, mashallah. There's a very nice book. Uh, the translation of um, a compilation of prophetic hadith called Nahjul Fasaha, which is basically a collection of ethical traditions of the Prophet. We talk about manners and talk about etiquette, talk about manners of akhlaq more generally. You could find it online, you could send me an email, I could send you a link to it as well. Just in sort of the spirit of building relationship with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on these nights might be good to again like i mentioned before reflect on some of these words as well okay if you would like to listen to more please donate to www.icnyu.org donate for more of our virtual programs go to www.icnyu.org classes if you have any questions email us at info at icnyu.org